wonderful to have you all join us today. My name is Guy Boggs. I'm CEO of the Cooperative Research Centre for Transformations in Mining Economies. Um, and before we formally get started, I'd just uh, like to note that the session today will be recorded so that we can share uh, the presentation panel um, with uh, beyond the beyond the forum today. Um, as I said, uh, my name's Guy Boggs, I'm CEO. I'm delighted to kick today off. Um, and before we go into to further matters, I'd like to acknowledge country um, and pay, acknowledge the traditional custodians across all the lands on which we live and work and pay our respects to, to elders past and present. Um, I'm joining you today from uh, Wajuk country as part of the Noongar Nation in Western Australia. Um, so I have the, the privilege of introducing today's uh, session. Um, and for those who have uh, followed the, the journey of the Cooperative Research Centre for Transformations in Mining Economy, CRC Time, you'll note that when we began our consultation process, it was soon after uh, a really um, significant report was released by the CIRO Futures team in 2017. Um, this was a roadmap for unlocking future growth in the METS industry, in the mining equipment, technology and services sector. This was a really important report highlighting all the areas in which Australia is positioned uh, at the forefront of METS industry development. Um, and for our CRC, one of the things that we looked at as part of that, that report was the framing of the, the nature of businesses that are contributing to the delivery of remediation services, which was touched on um, as a key part of the, the, the Australia's METS industry. Um, when we put the, the bid forward to, to the Australian government, we suggested that there is potential to really you know, tap into the, the mine closure sector um, and grow it. Um, Australia has world leading uh, policy environment for uh, sustainability. Um, it's at the forefront of technology and thought leadership in our research sector around rehabilitation and closure. Um, and so this report that we'll be looking at today is, is really the culmination of thinking about, well, how do we do a, a deep dive into understanding and unpacking what the future growth opportunities are for this industry, which started with actually a definition. Um, and I'm delighted um, when Dominique takes us through the, the report that now we have a clear articulation of what it means to, to be part of the mine closure solutions industry, what the different elements of that are, and how we might be able to, to support its growth. Um, so we know that mine closure and post mine transitions is a really important part of the sector's growth. Um, we're seeing that on, on both sides of um, yeah, the push for um, and the need for massive critical minerals development to support decarbonisation efforts. This is gonna require a lot of new mining. And with every new mine, we need to really think about mine closure um, at the front end, and so there's a lot of opportunities for our businesses that operate in the mine closure and solutions uh, industry to be supporting uh, this this future critical minerals development. At the over the life of mine and beyond the life of mine, we're seeing the decarbonisation and energy transitions also lead to our mines transitioning being transitioned out. Now this is part of a, a broader sector um, and requirement for for, for closures anyway. Um, and the execution of closure brings a whole suite of other um, business and economic opportunities to contribute as we see the liabilities that have been um, noted for closure being, being brought forward into execution. So for us in this journey of recognising and capitalising on Australia's strengths in mine closure and positioning Australia as a, a, a global leader, in, in supporting and enabling mine closure executions by supporting Australia's METS industry to uh, position themselves to service not only Australia's domestic demand for mine closure services, but future global economic demands. This report is really critical. So um, without further ado, um, you will have noted in the program for today that we'll have a presentation um, from the, the, the lead author, Dominic Banfield on the report. Uh, followed by a panel session uh, with some great panel members and to be chaired by our External Relations and Impact Director, Gillian De Urso. Um, and before I hand to Dom, I would like to acknowledge um, particularly the leadership of our um, two program leaders, uh, Jason Kirby within CSIRO, 
and Anya Samper, who leads our operational solutions within this, uh, which in within which this program, this project fits. Um, but also we had an outstanding ste steering committee supporting this project's delivery. So uh, thank you to everyone who's contributed. What a privilege to 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 see this report being launched uh, today. Um, over to you, Don. Thanks so much, Guy, and, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I'd like to start by echoing Guy and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where I live and work, the uh, the Wurrung and Bunwurrung peoples of Kulin Nation. I'm dialing in from Nam today, Melbourne. Um, so it's been a real pleasure to deliver this report. Um, we've really got to work really closely with the the broad mine closure solutions and and mining industry to deliver it. Um, and I'll acknowledge some of the key players as we as we go forward. So I'll start by providing a little bit of background to the report, how it came about um, and what we set out to do. Um, I'll then discuss the key findings of our report and highlight some of the enabling actions. Um, I won't go through those in detail. You can read more about them when the report's officially released on Monday. So a little bit of promotion and um, explainer of who we are and why we're here. Um, as Guy mentioned, we delivered the mining equipment, technology and services roadmap way back in 2017. Um, we're CSIRO Futures, we're the strategic and economic advisory arm of CSIRO. Um, we deliver a broad range of, of roadmaps um, and exploratory projects, uh, exploring emerging science and technology challenges and opportunities um, and their relationship to Australia's industries. This is the project team. Um, I was really pleased to lead this project uh, with a huge amount of support from um, my official co-lead, Anthea Moisey, who's unfortunately recently left the team and is dialing in. Uh, supported by Jose uh, Jasmine, who led the economics component of this work, and our Associate Director, Vivek Srinivasan. Um, we're also supported by a range of cash and in-kind partners through the CRC. Um, in particular, I'd like to thank both Mirawa and Fortescue for being the major financial supporters of the project. And I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of our um, steering committee specifically, um, Kirsty Beckett from Fortescue and Dave Clark from GHD, who are joining us today for the panel discussion, Laura Majuka Suarez from Mirawa, John Briggs of Intract, Anya Sampa from CRC Time, and my colleagues Jason Kirby and Ewan Sellers from, from CSIRO for their input. Um, also, the CRC time team themselves, including but not limited to Guy, Gillian, Tom, um, and Adam Little Boy from UQ, who are all critical to this project's existence and success. So, I'll start with some core definitions. So, there is a lot of it's constantly evolving space, and the um, the terminology is constantly evolving as well. The term mine closure is has contested meanings. We frame mine closure and transitions being a broad description of the strategies and activities related to the completion of mining activities, rehabilitation of the mine lands, and the establishment of post-closure land uses. Um, that includes activities that occur before, during, and after the entire mining life cycle. We then define mine closure solutions as the equipment, technology, and services that are needed to support and enable these activities and mine closure solutions providers as the companies that provide these solutions. We note that some use the term METS to describe this industry, um, and arguably MCS providers are a subset of the, the mining equipment technology and services providers, but many of the mine closure solutions providers actually don't identify as METS because they provide services to a diverse range of industries. Um, I'd also like to note that a uh, some people don't like the term transitions and closure and prefer more ambitious terms like transformations to truly recognize the, uh, the broad variety of opportunities that are available for sites after rehabilitation closure and that closure alone may not be the best opportunity for all sites. So as I mentioned, um, he approached our team to design a project scope that explores the industry opportunities that will arise from addressing Australia's mine and closure challenges. Um, we consulted a broad range of stakeholders, undertook desktop research and some preliminary analysis to design the project scope for this project. Uh, at its core, the project is not actually about the challenge of mine closure, but it's about industry growth opportunities. However, I think it's important to note that these two topics are really closely linked. Um, by actively addressing Australia's mine closure challenges, we can grow this industry. And by growing this industry, we can optimise how we address mine closure challenges. In delivering this report, we wanted to ensure that all the opportunities and actions we identified were aligned to real industry needs. 
As such, we commenced this project and continued throughout by exploring challenges faced by experienced mine closure practitioners. We then used desktop research, further consultations and a workshop to confirm these challenges and define opportunities and potential solutions um, that can be delivered by mine closure solutions providers to address those challenges. We use further consultations and a workshop to identify and discuss the barriers to that industry's growth and identify potential enabling actions for individual stakeholder groups to help overcome them. Underpinning this and, and providing a really core context to this all um, was exploring the scale of expenditure on mine closure and related markets in Australia. Um, so my colleague Jasmine led uh, the design and uh, delivery of novel economic and market sizing analysis to explain this scale. Right over to the findings. So for some context, mining has contributed significantly to Australia's economic prosperity and will continue to play a critical role in the global economy by providing the mineral commodities that our society needs. In particular, there's a growing demand for critical minerals required to support decarbonisation. Um, and my, however, mining is a temporary land use that can have mixed effects on local communities and detrimental environmental impacts if not well managed. When mine closure does not ad adequately address these impacts, the already low levels of trust in the mining sector are further diminished. Miners, regulators and communities are all increasingly aware of these impacts and risks, um, and many industry leaders have identified the importance of addressing these issues and rebuilding trust in the sector to ensure a social license going forward. There's patchy available data on the topic of mine closure and its success in Australia, but previous studies from 2017 and 2021 respectively have identified only 22 examples of mines that have been closed, rehabilitated and relinquished in Australia, and only 15 examples of repurposed mine land in Australia. To put this in context, Australia currently has around 2,200 active mine sites, um, and there are estimates of tens of thousands of inactive and unrehabilitated mine sites with varying risk and um, size profiles. So to get into our unique analysis, um, successful mine closure uh, is both an expensive challenge, but also an opportunity for the development of a skilled industry of mine closure solutions providers. So our analysis of the S&P Global Market Intelligence Database um, identified around 240 Australian mines that are expected to end their economically productive life between 2021 and 2040. Uh, almost 50% of these sites were in Western Australia. Um, however, there were significant numbers of sites also identified in New South Wales, the Northern Territory and Queensland. By applying high level uh, conservative um, estimates of the cost of closure to these sites, um, which were developed in consultation with industry experts, uh, we estimate that annual expenditure on the rehabilitation and closure activities for these sites alone could exceed $4 billion per year over the next 17 years or so. We do acknowledge there are lots of uncertainties, lots of moving parts, lots of changes here and, and underlying data quality issues that will affect the accuracy of the estimates. However, with increasing demand for many minerals, the aforementioned 2,200 active mines and unrehabilitated mines in Australia, the um, challenges and opportunities associated with mine closure and transitions will only increase with time. This will require innovative mine closure solutions um, to address the risks of these um, mines closing and reduce the cost of rehabilitation and other activities. Overall, we believe this presents an opportunity for the development of a skilled ecosystem of mine closure solutions providers that can improve the economic, social and environmental outcomes of mine closure. So where are these actual opportunities? Um, our report explores four themes of challenges and opportunities. These are enabling and facilitating effective, respectful and mutually beneficial engagements and partnerships with diverse stakeholders. Optimizing mine waste management by applying waste hierarchy principles and circular economy principles to reduce waste and increase resource recovery. Applying innovative solutions to increase the performance of mine rehabilitation activities. And finally, uh, solutions that enable land use transitions and optimise post mining outcomes for both mining communities and other stakeholders. Within these four themes, we identified 11 discrete challenges and 22 potential solutions. Um, we'd like to stress that these are neither universal nor exhaustive. There's a huge variation in the challenges that face individual mine sites. Um, 
but they together illustrate the wide range of opportunities for Australian businesses to support mine closure and transitions. Across the next couple of slides, I'll highlight an, an individual solution opportunity or opportunity um, in each of these four themes. Um, they're very limited, designed to be illustrative only, and I would encourage you to read the full report to get the full breadth of opportunities. First of all, as I noted, the success of mine closure and transitions really requires meaningful engagement with a diverse range of stakeholders. Uh, as, as Julian will stress, um, this is actually one of the harder parts of mining in many respects. We've been doing technical aspects of mining for years, but engaging communities, ensuring that um, communities are brought along for the mining journey is incredibly challenging and often undervalued. Solutions that can assist closure practitioners to effectively and inclusively communicate complex and tactical information that is associated with mine closure activities are really critical. Examples we explore briefly in the report include interactive mapping tools and visual models for stakeholder engagement. And here we show an example of a digital twin projection at the QCAT Centre. In waste reduction and resource recovery, we discuss circular economy and waste management hierarchy principles being applied to both reduce risks, but also to create potential additional economic opportunities during mining operations. A core example is that minerals found in mine waste stockpiles, tailings, and other metallurgical processing, um, as mineral waste streams, can be repurposed to create resilient and low emission construction products and other potential high value products. Uh, an example is that Murdoch University researchers are developing and have kind of piloted low emissions geopolymer concrete from fly ash and other industrial byproducts. Uh, if these approaches are commercially feasible, they can help address both waste and decarbonisation challenges in both mining and construction industries. A common uh, challenge shared by many of the mine closure practitioners we spoke to was the high cost and, and difficulty in accessing high quality topsoil for revegetation and erosion control. Uh, cost effective soil treatment solutions have the potential to improve physical, chemical, and biological quality of soil on site uh, and reduce the cost of importing topsoil. This can potentially aid in ecological restoration or development of sites uh, at a lower cost. Uh, the photo here is from a recent, a relatively recent project at the Engine Mine in Queensland, um, in which uh, soil cyclers deployed solutions to facilitate topsoil amelioration, geotechnical soil amendments, um, and acid sulfate soil remediation to generate topsoil from overburden material. It's a fairly well known and, and awarded uh, case study, but it highlights the really importance of collaboration as other parties were involved in, in planning and facilitating this and also um, deploying bioremediation uh, expertise to treat mine water to create water suitable for growing a pasture. Last but certainly not least uh, was the real importance of establishing um, post-mining land use or post-closure land uses. Uh, this is really critical to meeting the needs of communities and um, com that have been reliant on mining for a long time. So repurposing mined land and the related assets for new uses and industries can help to meet those community and cultural needs and interests um, and optimise mining transitions more broadly. Uh, these uses can include, but are not limited to, agricultural uses, uh, renewable energy, uh, tourism um, and education sites. And the core here was that we really need uh, specialist services um, that can help facilitate the identification, development and transition of mining land to uh, future post-mining um, land uses. There's a clear need for specialists with cross-sectoral experience to facilitate those outcomes. Moving on to the enabling actions, now I'd like to stress here that these are not recommendations by CSI Road to anyone else. Um, these actions were developed in collaboration with stakeholders and really reflect the what we believe are fairly consensus views of stakeholders involved in this sector. So coordinated and targeted action from government and industry leaders is required to address the barriers to the further development of Australia's mine closed solutions industry. Now we use consultations and a workshop to collaboratively develop 11 targeted and coordinated actions for industry and government stakeholders that can help support industry growth and enhance the outcomes for all stakeholders. These actions are directed to mine closure solutions industry itself, um, the mining industry, and to government as well. 
however, most of these actions require a degree of collaboration, and I'll try and focus on the subset that is identified that requires coordinated action from all three stakeholders here. Um, first and foremost, we found that uh, improving transparency and awareness of the diversity of mine closure challenges and the opportunities related it will be really critical. Um, there's a degree of opaqueness um, to the challenges faced by mine closure um, solutions, uh, sorry, mine closure practitioners on a day to day level, um, which makes it quite challenging for companies, especially SMEs, to engage in them and try and offer their solutions, especially when they're not already engaged in the, the mining or met sector already. Second, uh, there are limited avenues to really value the social and environmental outcomes of mine closure and transitions, um, and the efforts to continue developing and, and implementing the methods that value uh, these outcomes can improve the nuance of mine closure economics and impact planning. And third is addressing the risk aversion to, to novel technologies and helping uh, upscale the deployments of emerging technologies that can address these challenges by uh, developing and supporting a collaborative environment for research and demonstration of innovative solutions. Each of these actions um, and the individual actions for stakeholders is impacted in much, further, much greater detail in the report. So I won't go into them further today, um, but I encourage you to read the full detail in the report when it's released on Monday. Thanks very much for your time. I've been Dominic Banfield, and I'd like to hand over to our panel. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you so much, Dominique. Um, we're so pleased, and I might just see if we can take the present up. Ah, perfect, you're onto it. Hi, everyone. I'm so pleased to be here on behalf of CRC Time to facilitate the panel section um, session next. And while um, our panelist, Dave, Carolina, and Kirsty joined Dominique on the screen. I'd just like to, to acknowledge country. Um, and one of the points that I think really comes through in the report um, is the potential for further work to really understand the opportunities for Indigenous businesses involved in mine closure and rehabilitation, um, particularly as we know, um, as I know from experience, that that's often an area of interest for traditional owner and other groups. So with that, I have the fortune I'm representing my colleagues and facilitating this panel session. And um, we've got a couple of questions. So, but first of all, I just wanted to say how lucky we are to have the people joining us to speak about the report, but also the topic of um, opportunities um, in mine closure and transitions for mining equipment and technology and services businesses, but also how we change and look at reframing mine closure as, an as a liability to an opportunity. Um, and shift from thinking about mining at um, closure from an end to a transition to a transformation. So I'll do a quick one line introduction and please panelists feel free to share more about yourself. Um, I'm delighted to say that we have Dave Clark, who's um, Australian Resources Leader at GHD, and I'm sure many of you will on the call will know Dave's vast experience across a range of um, really advocating for an improved industry. Um, we have Kirsty Beckett, who is Mine Closure Lead at Fortescue and also one of the co-founders of the Closure Planning Practitioners Association. And we have Carolina Schakowska, who is General Manager Workforce and Innovation at the Minerals Council of Australia and has a long history in working in innovation policy. So I'll kick off with, um, and we might, we'll go through to everyone, but we might kick off with you, uh, Kirsty, to start off with. What report findings resonated with you the most? Sorry, playing with buttons. Um, I've, I've got to say all of them. I think they're, <laughs> none of them um, stand out alone. They are all required as part of the puzzle to get to an effective closure solution. And I think part of the issue we're grappling with at the moment is you can't, or well, I can't tease out one area. And if I found that we solved one of those four cornerstones, I think we would still fail to, to achieve successful closure. Um, I think it's really critical that we have looked at um, such a wide, diverse range of questions and been able to com to narrow that down just to those four, those four cornerstones. Um, because without solving for all of those, uh, we all fail together. And Kirsty, just to just um, 
to reiterate, were you thinking, were you talking about the cornerstones of engagement and partnerships, waste recovery and re um, waste reduction yep. and resource recovery, mine rehabilitation and land use transitions? I just wanted yes. to say that again um, <laughs> so that people had those four at the top of their mind. Dave, what about you? Uh, yeah, it's a little bit tricky, as Kirsty said, and well done, Dom, in terms of tabling the, the report. Um, and thanks, Gillian. I think um, for me, what resonated or what stuck out, there are probably a few areas. Um, the, the scale of the challenge, I guess, in terms of the number of mine closures planned over the next 20 year period, in terms of that graph that Dom sort of pulled up. But, but of course, that provides us with an opportunity um, around, you know, materially improving the way in which we transition these sites or transform those sites um, and, and around some of those um, repurposing and rehabilitation outcomes. I, I think, you know, clearly uh, there's a need for us to gear up in the short term with, given those numbers, the 240-odd with a third of those occurring in that five-year period from 2026 to 2030. So that's something that that jumped out at me. But also around the, the nature of the significant and diverse opportunities for industry um, to add value through that that important sort of period of time. Um, so they sort of stuck out at me, but but the other one, um, the, the section on engagements and partnerships, I think is a really important one. And um, again, as Don touched on earlier, to help ad address that trust deficit and, and recognising the diversity of stakeholders with varying sort of values and perspectives and and I think highlighting that need for um, the, the more effective engagement as part of these processes as well through our sort of planning and decision making. And it's perhaps something that we might get into again shortly. Thanks, Gillian. Thank you so much, Dave. And Carolina, what about you? Uh, thanks, Gillian. And look, yes, I, I would echo um, both Kirsty's and Dave's thoughts. For me, um, I think the two things stood out, the first one being the critical role of innovation, research and development as an enabler across all four opportunities that are explored in the report. Um, and in particular, for me, the value of sourcing and applying accurate, timely and real time where possible um, data to better understand, plan and execute mine closure and post mine closure activity. Um, and the other one was the importance of considering and leveraging the human, physical and social assets created throughout the life of mine when exploring post um, post land use um, opportunities. Um, so in particular, I think it's ensuring that that's embedded and executed um, throughout the life of mine. And I see one of the things that really came out through the report was the innovative integrated approach to stakeholder engagement, um, which I think not only resonates strongly throughout the report, but is the thing that will hinge on um, successfully uh, looking at how we actually implement some of the opportunities. Uh, and look, there's some examples that that, that we can sort of perhaps um, talk through later. Fantastic. And Dominic, did you want to share anything that resonated with you or have you covered it in your presentation? I wrote it. It all resonates with me. Um, <laughs> Um, I think I think I agree with Kirsty. One thing I wanted to note, just a, a little bit of nuance around the the 240 mines. Um, mm -hmm. We're not trying to fear monger with that number, um, and that number will will change. Um, mines defer their closure dates for a wide range of reasons, um, economic um, reasons, and you know just the cost of um, minerals at any one time, wide amongst them. Um, one thing I yeah really highlight probably. Uh, is I tried to get into the start. One, one thing we really grappled with during this project is when, whenever we spoke to someone, they wanted to talk about all the challenges in mine closure. Um, and if we don't, and all the things that needed to happen differently to address those challenges. Um, so we always had to kind of redirect them to the opportunities. And I think that we need to kind of a, to change our perspective uh, as a nation and as a sector um, to, it realize that there are both, but they need to be addressed together to kind of solve both, to capture the opportunity and solve the challenge. That's a fantastic point. And I think the point about um, just being aware that the number of the identified mines, you know, that's a that's an estimate and based on the available information and what's being released now, and we know that mine uh, end of production dates change all the time, but it's also important to be realistic as well that mines are based on a finite resource. And I think being aware that these opportunities exist 
um, to make the moat to really what I think is crucially important, which is maximising the value that you get from mining a deposit comes from um, getting the most out of the closure and transition process as well. Um, so, Dave, I'll kick off with you with the um, directed question, which was the report identified the opportunities in uh, reprocessing of mine waste, environmental management, engagement and partnerships, um, repurposing of infrastructure and a whole range of activities. Um, how has this part of the MET sector changed over time and what do you see happening next? Uh, thanks, Gillian. You've covered some important ground there, and we could discuss that for a fair while. But anyway, I'll 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 try yeah. to cut to the chase. Look, I think you know around circularity, which has been touched on, post mining land uses, uh, robust and sustainable environmental sort of management are, are all really critical. And I think um, we're starting to see some more innovative solutions being sort of implemented, which is really encouraging. I think there's great opportunities as we move ahead. But I think. Um, from a MET sector perspective, there's been um, a definite increase in the way in which we partner and uh, we're able to innovate. There's, there's really increased open-mindedness in, in that regard. And, and we're seeing that through different procurement processes as well and some of the global challenges that are out there led by companies and, and also sort of researchers. Um, through, I guess, our experiences within GHD and, and through others, I think there's an increase in the flexibility around service providers and suppliers in terms of um, the large and mid-tier sort of panel arrangements through companies and tender processes. And, and we're seeing more and more this sort of um, uh, matchmaking beyond identifying those organisations who have the potential to add value in the right sort of solution. So, and whether that's done proactively by the METS companies or facilitated by the mining companies too. And I think, um, for me, that's really important and that that industry collaboration and true partnering earlier within these study processes and, and within that mining life cycle um, is is key. And so there's a um, I just think there are more possibilities being explored for for solutions that co-design sort of piece that I think Dom might have touched on earlier before landing on um, those preferred options for for the best outcomes, if you like. And, and it's going to um, it is now, and I think there needs to be more of it, but around that more meaningful stakeholder engagement, we've already touched on that a couple of times, and involvement as part of that decision making, and, and really importantly for the social side and the community buying as well. But one, just a couple of reflections that I think relate to that point from the um, CRC forum we were fortunate to have in La Trobe Valley last week was around a similar topic in terms of more meaningful um, earlier engagement. This this phrase, deep listening, was was coined there, which I, I think was a great sort of takeaway. And, and it's and it's around that consent from country as well. So um, I, I think that's that's really relevant. The forum was very inspirational, by the way. And the last point that I'll make is that um, we're we're seeing I think we're seeing some different, and more sophisticated mechanisms for that effective dialogue to occur as part of engagement processes. Thanks, Julie. Thank you so much. And I think the the term, the um, Aboriginal language term, I can't remember it off the top, but really um, having that deep listing is what will help us unlock some of the other opportunities. So in terms of um, the post mining um, repurposing and also management of revegetation and the biodiversity. So I think they all fit together. But Kirsty, um, Dominic touched on it before, but I'll ask you um, to elaborate perhaps. You know, there's a huge amount of annual expenditure planned, upwards of $4 billion conservatively based on um, the analysis that was undertaken. How do we switch the thinking about CE mine closure from the, um, and the expenditure from a liability to an opportunity and really unlock those possibilities? And I can see the conversation all fitting together as we're talking. Yeah, so I think one of the biggest challenges and opportunities is to get people comfortable with the magnitude of those costs. Um, a lot of people are really uncomfortable in this space talking about how much money needs to be spent. Um, but that's the opportunity because once we can put an, a number to it, we can actually start to engage other parts of our uh, mining businesses and service sectors to understand that this is an important aspect. This has um, implications for all sorts of activities. And if we can then start to build the business case for better integration and planning into the mine life cycle, we've got more time to resolve the, 
the problems, which brings more opportunity to get to good solutions while we're operating, rather than waiting until we're five years from closure or it's already happening um, before we start the conversations, particularly if we have technical issues that we need a fair few years to resolve and, and the conversations still need to be had with the communities while you're still trying to change technologies. So I think there's a good opportunity there by expressing the size and value. It, it really is that four to eight billion dollars. And that's, of course, assuming no new mines open in that time. So the numbers we're putting forward there is really where the where the nation is at now, not even with any boom that we might see from new mining companies opening up. Um, but the next opportunity comes are in that execution space to look at different models for expending that funding. So the, if we're really serious about sustainable jobs and making a sustained and um, equitable transition, we need to look at whether that money is spent in a really fast slapdash manner with massive contractors coming on site to get everything rapidly done and then they rapidly dis disappear from the community. Or do we look at other models where maybe we do a slower transition to closure? We manage all our risks and um, our issues on site, but maybe there's better ways that can that money can be expended that might be more suitable for different communities in, in different situations and different mining settings. So I think understanding the size of that prize, which is what this report starts to really bring out, um, gives us that time and that space to really think through the nature of the problem before we're, it, it, it's on us and we're closing the doors. I think that's a really good framing and a really good explanation, Kirsty. Particularly, um, it wasn't, it, we looked at Indigenous businesses and regional businesses at a high level as part of this report, but not in detail. And I think this really sets the foundation for perhaps further work in terms of how you can structure that expenditure and support the development of businesses. So I just wanted to flag that. Um, as a opportunity for future work. Uh, Carolina, we often talk about innovation and I know we've often spoken about innovation. So I just wanted to understand what innovation means to you and what you see it meaning in the context of the mining and the MET sector as it relates to closure. Thanks, Gillian. And look, this is a good question and I might um, use a bit of poetic license here just to uh, reflect on something that Kirsty mentioned and that was regarding the importance of integrating mine closure uh, planning throughout the mining life cycle. Um, I think that is where there is a real opportunity um, to apply innovation and technology um, to really support this. So, you know, for example, leveraging um, digital mines and the real-time data that you can get from other aspects of technology across, across your operations to actively refine any planned approaches um, to the mine closure and be able to do that throughout the life of mine so that you are continuously thinking about how does this actually um, impact what we're planning to do at the other end because we've got the actual data. It's not just hypothesis anymore. Um, but look, uh, definitely a, a big question um, thinking about innovation and everybody looks at it differently. Um, you know, for me, broadly, innovation refers to the change um, in a method of supplying goods or services, whether that's through new products, whether that's the processes for producing existing products, whether it's new forms of work organisation, approaches to engagement, uh, improved handling of material or opening up of new markets um, or sources of supply. But innovation is not an end in itself for us. Um, it's a mean of gathering a competitive advantage or adapting to changing market conditions. And so, you know, the mining industry is seen as a global technology leader and one of the most productive industries in the world. And for us, we see innovation occurring across the full value chain within what we refer to here at the MCA as the mining innovation ecosystem. So this includes miners, the mining workforce, the mining equipment technology and services sector, um, original equipment manufacturers, university-led mining research institutions, uh, CRCs, as well as CSRO-led research collaborations. And for us, that collaboration both within industry and between industry and researchers, that's what helps us to advance our knowledge to solve some of those industry-wide problems and to really look at how we can benefit the whole of the economy through the activity that we undertake. Um, but specifically, you know, you asked about METs. The minerals industry works closely with 
you know, um, technology partners across um, the sector to facilitate testing of scale and opportunities to market and building skills and capability and creating new jobs. And it's that whole uh, bucket of activity that's really crucial here, not just looking at what are the solutions, but what are the skills and capabilities we need? How do we actually work together to apply those? Um, and look, for me, I mentioned previously that innovation, research and development, I see as a critical enabler across all of the opportunities. But in order for that to happen, we really need the right policy and regulatory frameworks um, to support the innovation ecosystem that is required to actually unlock and accelerate the necessary innovation, research and development activities at the pace and the scale that we need them in order to actually capture these opportunities. And so the report, you know, um, does provide some, um, you know, opportunities and recommendations and innate, sorry, not recommendations, I, I, I enablers um, around uh, policy and uh, regulatory barriers. So for me, in reviewing those, um, it would be who the government to really look at um, how regulation can keep pace with emerging technologies and how it can be coordinated um, across governments to enable it for adoption within industry. So we've been advocating for government to work with industry um, to co-design an innovation blueprint to establish sandboxes that would accelerate the testing, prototyping and commercialisation of technologies that are relevant for us to get to where we want to go. So this aligns, I feel, with um, the proposed approach to pilot and demonstrate the sites in the report around um, land use transitions. Thanks, Carolina. Dave, I might, that was, oh, did you want to say something, Dominique? Just, just a quick comment. So um, one of the consultations I had um, kind of highlighted the the opportunity to use the, the abandoned sites we have in Australia mm -hmm. that, that do need, um, some of them do have problems that need addressing, whether it's acid mine drainage or um, structural issues or various other risks. They actually present an opportunity um, for us to test new um, solutions. Um, if we if if there's a funding source, um, then we need a funding source and a structure and and regulatory sandboxes to enable that. So there's a there's a large opportunity there if it if, if it was uh, if there's political will to capture it. And um, I think I'll do a bit of a plug for some previous work that the CRC time did, which was identifying a network of potential demonstration and pilot sites to do this type of work and. Um, we are looking at um, a number of, um, in our own support for innovation, looking at um, using those for on-ground testing, but there's always more that can be done under the right settings. Um, Dave, I'll flip it to you. And I just wanted to, like, um, when I look at and when we share it, I, I know we're doing a pre-briefing, so just giving everyone a bit of a taster. But when you look at the opportunities around re mine rehab, the um, waste recovery, potentially using um, waste as new inputs, um, looking at how to use infrastructure from accommodation and also the in-ground. So amazing things like um, my personal favourite, the Stall Underground Physics Lab, um, which is up next to an operating mine. How have you seen the um, How do you see the relationship working between the mining company and the operator and the METS companies providing the solutions? And where do you think, um, what, what kind of arrangements need to be in place to really unlock these opportunities or how is that, rela is that relationship changing to do so? Yeah, thanks, Gillian. Another good question. Uh, I suppose building on a couple of things that I touched on earlier, um, I, I think in terms of the relationship, we, we are experiencing an increased level of maturity and trust between the mining companies and, and met sort of enterprises. Uh, often these things can come down to the individuals involved as well, but in the main, um, B2B, that's what we're sort of seeing. And, and that's, and, and again, it's that trust piece, I guess, and outside of the community trust and other stakeholder trust that we mentioned earlier, um, really seeing that through the collaborative sort of arrangements there. So I think there, there is a trend towards more strategic and trusted relationships and, and partnerships versus transactional we've been through sort of phases i reckon over the journey but that's where it needs to to head and it and it's really around um teaming on a best for site transformation or site closure or rehabilitation outcomes basis versus business as usual um in terms of some of the traditional arrangements and relationships so th th there is a shift there and i'm hoping that this piece of work will be the trigger for for more of that as well but i think it's naturally uh, heading in that direction. The, the other thing is um, 
there's in the closure space again there's a sincere level of um interest at the c-suite level around clarity on leadership sponsorship for example around and governance processes through project or program sort of delivery as well which didn't necessarily sort of exist uh, exist previously and, and i suppose for me uh jillian and the team the last couple of points are around a, a better I think there's a better appreciation and, and you know the ESG drivers uh, are really sort of prominent for all of us but around the um including on the social license side of things that there's a I think the these overarching strategic imperatives and drivers are relevant and considered in terms of how relationships are being formed and managed and and so I think those strengthened connections um around the related sort of studies and site transition execution and closure is um uh, is is where it's heading and I, and I think what it means to your question is around um the significant investments that are, that are required let's call them investments rather than just costs or expenditure um beyond the operational phases of mining will really well it'll truly help to create that lasting benefit to the community and help avoid surprises and, and really provide uh, a more positive, much more positive legacies than, you know, has traditionally been the place. And we've we've seen the the negative sort of legacies that have impacted on the reputation of the, the mining industry more broadly. So here's an opportunity to create so many positive legacies and we're starting to see some of that. Thanks, Julian. Thank you so much. And Kirsty, I'm going to move quickly to you because this is such a rich discussion um, and I'm always conscious of time. But what outcomes would you like to see? So when we share the report more broadly on Monday, we this pre-briefing gives us an opportunity to foreshadow some of the findings so they're not a surprise. Um, but also, you know, to, to really, when we share it, to maybe highlight a few things in our communications. What outcomes would you like to see as a result and how do we unlock those? Well, I think the big challenge for us and where that opportunity lies is that the mining industry needs help to successfully close the mines. We all want to work together. Um, what I'm hoping this report does is demystify where those opportunities are. All the work has been done for all the allied industries. So if you haven't worked in the closure space before, this is the opportunity to step forward and say, where is something that we do well as a company that this could be another avenue for us to move into, invest and expand and help to resolve the closure industry? And I mean, Fortescue's already seen fantastic success looking sideways for our green transition by looking outside of the mining industry and bringing that on board to, to get some of our green fleet solutions underway much faster than anyone ever anticipated. So I think this report moves in that same direction. It's simple, it's very clear, it's very direct. All the hard work has been already done by the, the Brains Trust behind the report, which hopefully then sets up anyone who's looking to invest time and resources in this space to see where the, the, the critical opportunities are um, to go forward. Thank you, Kirsty. That's a really big call to action for us as well. And also a reminder that as a sector, we do get very narrowly, we can get very narrowly focused on how we do things. And um, I think we can learn so much from thinking of different ways of working and reaching out beyond us. So, Carolina, last question. I just wanted to ask, or last formal question, um, how do we support transferability within sectors, which is the perfect segue um, so we're like, for example, we've seen the Kidston example with the uh, pit void being used for renewable energy. Um, we've seen um, the stall underground physics labs, um, stall mines still operating, but that um, alongside it, we're seeing bike parks, we're seeing a whole range of different things, as well as the um, other activities that are required with race reduction and whatnot. How do we support that transferability and including with the renewable energy sector? So I'll leave that with you. <laughs> Big um, question, but I wanted to get a I'll lot of points that, so people know what, where I'm going. Yeah, no, look, thanks, Gillian. And, and I think the thing we can take away from this uh, report at the end of the day is that um, there was never going to be a small question. It was never going to be a small <laughs> issue. It is a, it is a very large and complex area and you can fall into lots of rabbit holes here. For me, um, two things. One, I think it's, uh, and, and most critically, I think it's, it's very reflective, again, of what Kirsty said, but in the opposite direction. And that's, you know, 
transferability centered around skills and business capability. And, and what is it that we can bring across, particularly when we look at skills, not just in the context of, um, you know, what we have right now across the industry and how those skills can support the clean energy sector. I mean, that's one of our biggest um, challenges at the moment is really getting our hands around what does the workforce profile look like across these different sectors and how do we make sure that we're leveraging the skills we already have and providing those transition points where there's opportunities for people to be able to A, follow their interests, but B, be able to apply their skills in an area where there's that need to actually build that capability within that sector further. Um, but also equally, it's looking at how we combine that, again, with innovation and with technology and the activity that we've already done to date and how do we use the findings or the lessons from those experiences to not only share and, and be able to sort of go, okay, well, this didn't work in this context, but it can work in that context, or to be able to elevate. So when we look at the work that's been done between space and mining, everything from the first use of digital twins through to now Australia being that critical um, input around automation and how, how we can actually uh, apply that to, you know, the context of space, which is just huge. So if we can take that same approach and, and look at it in the context of uh, mine closure and post mine closure and look at how we can leverage the different um, skills, the different capabilities and the opportunities. Um, I think that that will get us quite far. Uh, and, and look, this may be a very, very um, small link here, but you did mention a number of, um, you know, um, post, uh, land transition use um examples and I really did just want to highlight another one which actually speaks very much to the importance of the partnerships, the importance of government support and the and the opportunities when you do work across different sectors. Um, and that's um and that's actually uh, one of the greatest mountain biking trails in Australia that is globally recognized, um, which is in Derby in Tasmania. And look, this is what's exciting here is they've developed a whole mecca, an entire mecca for for this um, this um, cohort of people that will invest significantly in the experience, which is one of the important components, but also provides opportunities for businesses, whether it's the accommodation, whether it's the food, uh, whether it's the other attractions that are around within the area. All of these um, provide a really great opportunity for us to think, what can we do in other areas? And the important thing here is that these are mountain biking trails, one of which is actually on a previous mine, and they actually celebrate that. They talk about the fact that you've got boulders and things here that create a natural uh, a natural playground for mountain bikers, um, but it's creating that connection from the heritage of the mine site with the future, which is what we should really be looking at doing and not not shying away from that. Thank you so much, Carolina. And I think I really like your point about, well, it might not be possible to have a, a bike, a mountain biking facility at every site. It opens your mind up to what the possibilities may be. And I think it's bringing that different frame, knowing that not everything is possible, but thinking about the possibilities um, in terms of feasibility, desirability and viability, which is something that came out of our foundational research. So I'll ask everyone, it was going to be a minute, but we've had a rich discussion, a bit of a 30 second wrap up. Um, Dave, I'll go to you, then Kirsty, then Carolina, and then Dom, um, and then I'll pass over to Guy, but I'll, I'll have to say one or two things after that. So Dave. Jeez, you've given me a challenge, 30 seconds. Okay, <laughs> Jillian, I'll, I'll be as quick I as I can. I won't time you, so I, don't I, worry. I'm, I'm usually, a, uh, as people who know me, really sort of positive and optimistic person, but I, I do just want to reinforce, um, let, you can't under underestimate some of the complexities associated with achieving long-term, safe, stable, non-polluting conditions into perpetuity yeah. um, for many sort of unique environments and situations. So therefore, and uh, Caroline has sort of touched on it, but, you know, talented people, companies, great solutions are just so critical if we're to um, get this right. So I just wanted to reinforce that point. Need for highly collaborative and integrated approaches. 
it's a delicate balance, but keeping feasible transition options open for as long as we reasonably can is really important because of the way in which things can sort of change. And final one um, is just on building capability with my other uh, hat on, my OSIMM hat on, I'm sure Guy won't mind, but we've just um, finished our first uh, integrated mine closure uh, course, which from what I can understand, it was a great success. So I just want to encourage people to, and, and that's not the only avenue, there are other avenues. Let's keep up skilling our people um, to achieve better outcomes. Thanks, Julie. Thank you so much. Kirsty. Okay, so I'll go from Dave's optimism to practicality. Um, so what does this do report do? Um, if you are in that closure planning space and you're having difficulties getting the business case across, getting the communication to the upper executive levels of your businesses, this is the document to put forward to them. It simplifies the state of the nation for where closure planning is at the moment, where challenges for closure occurring, and gives you some pointers but not recommendations for how to move forward so that it's not a solution document, but it it, it brings it all together in, in a nice, short, easily readable, easily digestible way. Carolina, thank you, Kirsty. Uh, thanks, thanks, Gillian. Look, there's, I think my biggest take home is that this is the starting point. We finally have something that really has died, died, has, 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 had a closer look at, um, you know, the challenges and the opportunities together and really provided us with some good, solid options around how to enable actually uh, leveraging those opportunities. But it, for me, it's a matter of not just having conversation and moving to that action phase. And in order for that to happen, we need to continue the discussion with the right people in the room. Uh, and, you know, this, this webinar is a really good starting point, but I think that there needs to be that consideration of when do we come together next collectively to think through what are the key bits that we really want to push in the first instance, because there are so many aspects and we need to think about what are those top level um, actions we can start focusing on so that we can really use this report to the benefit that you are seeking to put forward. And just really quickly in the last two seconds, um, we just also need to think about in anything that we put in place, whether it's, uh, you know, transitions, whether it's supports, uh, we need to think about the community and, and the impact that it has on community and ensuring that in working with them and those engagements that we think about how to support them beyond and external to the operations or the company uh, into that longer term sustainability. Thank you, Carolina and Dominique. I echo all three of those points. They're all fantastic. Thank you all for your support of the project. Um, it's been a real pleasure to work on this project, as I mentioned. Um, it's such a privilege to get to work with all the people working in the space. It's a, it's a group of incredibly passionate, motivated and smart individuals. Um, giving them the right resources to be able to solve these challenges is critical. And I found that many of the teams I spoke to were struggling to get the resourcing they need. So um, I'd really echo Kirsty's point, point on that and the importance of taking this challenge and opportunity seriously. Um, consider those costs as an investment, as Dave said, in, in an ongoing business and addressing the trust deficit and unlocking great opportunities for our communities. Thank you so much. Um, I just, before I hand over to Guy, I just wanted to say thank you to Dave, Kirsty, Carolina and Dominique for a really rich discussion. I agree that this will be one of many that we need to have to really unpack the report's findings, noting that we're in many ways it showcases the strength and diversity of the mine closure solutions industry that's already present and wants to look at new domestic and global opportunities. And I think um, just to summarise um, what really, um, there was a line that I think is really valuable in the report was how do we turn the mine closure challenge into an opportunity for um, uh, local Indigenous and Australian businesses um, nationally and globally. And I just want to keep that front and centre um, in how we look and solve the problem with further work and discussion potentially around um, how we attract the workforce, how to, what are the key things that we can actually do practically 
to unlock opportunities in the relationship between mining companies and METS companies, particular opportunities for regional and Indigenous businesses. So I, um, and I'll just also mention, because Dave reminded me, that we recently, through with our partners at UQ and Curtin, launched our uh, mass open online course in mine closure and sustainable transitions. Um, where there's a free option and a paid option, and we did that deliberately. So just acknowledging Tom and um, our research director and others to make it more broadly available. Um, so with that, thank you everyone for joining, and I'll just um, hand over to Guy if you just want to say one or two things to, just to close out. Oh, and thank you to Jason and Inez for letting me um, steal your seat at the panel discussion. Um, I'm so passionate about this area. I wanted to, um, they were so gracious. So thank you. That's a brilliant wrap up, Gillian. And um, my congratulations to the panel and Dom, the, the, the report team. Really proud of this piece of work. And what I heard from today's conversation is, you know, this is again at the start of the next phase of a conversation. Um, we're seeing, I mean, in the last five years, I've seen a real maturing here, Dave and Gillian talking about the education um, and training opportunities that are now opening up, but recognises that this is requires a particular skills and workforce needed. This is an area we need to grow and expand because we're actually identifying this as a sector um, for growth, a profession for growth, and this report uh, fully, uh, contributes to that. Um, the, my last thought, and Dave, I, 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 as you know, I stick on that that positive and optimism as well, and and I think. That's a really in incredibly exciting part of this story is reimagining what value and success looks like, economic, social, cultural and environmental, and how our investment can deliver as much value through the closure and post mine transition. So thank you, everybody. Wonderful discussion. Looking forward to the supply chain and value chain development in Australia and further positioning our world leading um, capability.